I believe that our sacred purpose in life is to know ourselves, our stories, the stories of the people we come from, our history and our culture. These are not only legacies passed down to us from generation to generation, but knowing these stories makes us witnesses to what our people went through, their glories and their sufferings. As the great playwright August Wilson said about why his work is so much about memory, he replied, if that connection to your grandparents is broken, then you're lost in the world. You don't know who you are. You don't know what your duty is without that tradition, without that legacy, without something in place which tells you how to conduct yourself then we're just wandering all over the world, all over the place, without any future, without any direction. Let me tell you about myself. I am from an Ashkenazic Jewish heritage, which means I'm from a 1,000 year Yiddish culture in Europe, and a total of 4,000 years of being part of the Jewish people. My people were under the rule of those who put them in Jewish ghettos with gates. I mean, that's where the word comes from. And they paid higher taxes for being in these lands that they were in. And they were even used for the actual tax collecting so that the nobles wouldn't be blamed for the high taxes that they used. My immediate family in Europe, in Romania, and Russia lived as nearly stateless and vulnerable due to being in these ghettos. They were also called shtetlach, and they were also the brunt of anti-Semitic hate. One of the classes I teach is one that goes abroad to Poland and the Czech Republic, and we study the theater about the Holocaust before the Holocaust occurred, during and after. And we go to the centers of these ghettos and these extermination camps, places that have been etched now into our memories like Auschwitz, Theresienstadt, Warsaw, Krakow, Woj. Let me tell you a true story that occurred to me the first time I visited Auschwitz. I'd been feeling very, very nervous. I knew that this was the location of one of the most horrible places ever on earth. I knew that nearly one million Jews had been exterminated there. And I knew that they had been exterminated in such a way with so much pain, with so much suffering, with so much misery, Every morning when I would wake up leading to the place as we went from location to location to Auschwitz, I would wake up crying. And as we got to the camp and we walked up to that infamous sign called Arbeit macht frei, work will make you free, so ironically written. There were birds flying overhead and their cries were screams, unearthly, as though they were the screams of the prisoners who had been in that camp. And then we went to one of the areas where Jews were gassed. That's when I no longer could hold it together. I reached out to a student I knew well. I screamed and cried and we held each other and we cried together, together, as though it was for our own families, for the lives of everyone there, for the lives of all of my students. We then went to an exhibit that had a huge room in it 
And in this room was one book. The book took up the entire space of the room. And you could turn the pages and read what was on each page. And on every single page was the name and location and date of that person's death. And it was alphabetized. So I looked for my name and I found it twice, not just my last name, but my first name twice. It was as though I was looking in the mirror and I was dead. Our responsibility is to not only join our stories together, but if we've learned anything in this pandemic is that not one story is more important than the other. We cannot be supremacist about it. My story must join with yours and yours with mine. There's a great play that I teach in my Jewish theater class. It's called the Dybbuk. And in it, there's a parable. Let me read you the parable. It's a parable from a great Hasidic rabbi named Rebbe Nachman of Bratzlov. And it's called the parable of the heart. At one end of the world stands a high mountain. And on the mountain, there's a large rock from which a clear spring flows. And the heart of the world is found at the end of this mountain. And as we know, everything in the world has a heart. And the world itself has one very large heart. And the heart of the world gazes continuously at the clear stream, loving it and never tiring of the sight. And though it never ceases thirsting for the stream and being drawn to it with the greatest longing and desire, it cannot come close to it. For as soon as the heart of the world moves, it loses sight of the clear stream on the mountaintop. And if the heart of the world does not see the stream for even a moment, it dies. And so righteousness from one person to the next to the next sees that heart and gathers the shining threads from the hearts of all the living beings and weaves them into time giving it to the heart of the world, and the heart of the world gives it to the stream. And so it lives another day. And that righteous person is you. The first time I learned this story, I learned it from my teacher and the Nobel Prize Peace Laureate, Elie Wiesel. He told it to illustrate the great Jewish stories of the Hasidic tradition, but it also meant something very personal to him. Because not only is it a story about love and a story about longing, it's a story about absence. And he knew about absence. He had personally experienced it in Auschwitz. He saw his beloved sister and mother taken away from him, and he never saw them again. He saw his father die right before him, reaching out, calling his name, and Ellie could not respond, or he knew he would die. Professor Wiesel told this in his own story a song for hope. I am the eye that looks at the eye that is looking. I shall look so hard that I shall be blinded. So what? I shall sing. 
I shall sing with such force that I shall go mad. So what? I shall dream. I shall dream that I am David, son of Sarah. And I tell my mother what I've done with her tears, with her prayers. I tell her what I've done with my years and my silences and my life. Why so late? I had no strength. I could not accept your absence. I've never written to you because I've never left you. You were the one that went away, and ever since I see you going away, I see nothing else. For years now, you have been leaving me, vanishing, swallowed by the black and silent tide. But the sky that drowned the fire, it cannot drown you, because you are the fire. You are the sky. And this hand, this hand that is writing, it is stretched toward you. And this vision which hounds me, it is my offering to you. And the silence, it is on your lips. And I give it back to you. That was one of Elie Wiesel's stories. He was a voice and a visionary who saw hope, even though he lived in the most horrific of circumstances, even though he lost everything. There's a saying in Judaism, it's all the world is a narrow bridge and above all, is not to fear at all. My words for you in this time is that at all times strive to be that bridge and to sing your song of hope and to sing it throughout your entire life with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And then any fear that you have will dissipate. It will dissipate in the knowledge that a heart is longing for you. <laughs>